open, open your Bibles there. And it says, verse 36 says, Therefore, all Israel, be assured of this, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promises for you and your children and for all who are far off. From for all whom the Lord our God will call. Then he goes on and says, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. I think the King James said to the church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple court. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. And enjoying the fear of all, and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Isn't that good news? Yeah. I want to talk to the church a few minutes today on this subject. I want to talk about the vital signs of a healthy church. All right. You may be seated. Now I've talked about on this subject in the past, uh, the one thing I liked about the way that uh, I've uh, developed myself over the years, that I might talk on the same subject, but I don't say the same thing the second time around. As a matter of fact, it's rare that I'll preach the same sermon twice. And, and uh, I might use the same text. And the reason I do that is because the church grows. People grow. People change. The church is continually evolving. And so I want to make sure that I'm open to the spirit that uh, he can deal with us in the time that we're currently living in. But let me say this to you guys in a quick uh, kind of way. Uh, every year, Denny and I go to see our doctor. Uh, for our, not because we are sick, but we go for our annual physical. And I want to invite you guys, maybe uh, especially you start to get past 50 years old, you need to go get your physical. Probably even before then. It, w it would be wise. It would be wise. Thank you, Ursh. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ursh. Uh, you might be wise when you go and get that done. But I did, I noticed something about the doctor. When we go in, he takes and check our vital signs. And based on those vital signs, he determines whether we are sick or not. Hmm? Uh, one of the things, he, I know one of the first things they do, they check and see what my temperature is. Y'all ever notice that? Every time you go to the doctor, they're going to check your temperature. And see if you, and then it, they be at a certain place. And then they'll always check your blood pressure. And then they want to check and see if it's too high or if it's too low. And then uh, they check your heartbeat. And see, they put that thing on you uh, sometimes. Like when I go to take my physical, they give me an EKG. They want to check and see what condition my heart is in. I took Jane to the doctor the other day, and they want to give her a stress test to see what the condition her heart is in. And right on down the line, uh, check your pulse. See if everything is, is, is right. And, uh, and, and then they make a determination. Uh, I have a pretty good idea of what kind of shape you're in. Huh? Based on those vital signs. They can tell you, well, you need, we need to do a little bit more checking here because this ain't right. Your blood pressure is 
too high, your blood pressure is too low, your temperature is too high, uh, your pulse is not quite, as, quite what it's supposed to be. Your EKG reading is off, and we need to check. And we, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to send you down to the hospital. We're going to put you in the hospital and do some further tests on you. And all that's based on your vital signs. And so it is within the context of our ministry, context of the church. The church has vital signs as well. And you can tell when a church is healthy if you just check the vital signs. Hmm? And that today I came to share with you uh, some things whether or not you can know whether or not uh, the church is healthy. And by the way, uh, if it's not healthy, it's probably because you are not healthy. I say probably because, see, the church is made up of us. It takes healthy people to make a healthy church. Did y'all hear what I just said? So don't start pointing your fingers at me when, you, when, when, I, when I say this. You, you, the first place I want you to look is look in your own heart. What, uh, ask yourself this question. Am I a healthy member in this body? Hmm? One thing about a, one thing about a pig-legged man, he can get where he's going even though he has to hop. It won't be a smooth journey. It might not get there as fast, but he'll get there in due time. And so it is with the church. You might cause us to be pig-legged, but we're going to get there. But we, it sure would be a whole lot better, though, if all of us were healthy and doing and playing our role. And so we could all be a, it could be a smooth journey because the leg is working right, the arms are working right, the head is working right, the chest is working right, the feet, the liver, the kidney, the heart, Everything is doing its own thing and doing it right. And one thing I found out about a healthy body, my heart, when it's working like it's supposed to, it, it, it does not make a big noise about what it's doing. My feet never fuss with the hand. It just do its thing. It just do what it's designed to do. And everything does what it's designed to do, and it's working in harmony, and next thing you know, you get on to where you need to get to. Am I right or wrong? Huh? Now, when something starts to hurting in my heart, it does affect the rest of us, though. But as long as it's healthy, you don't hear anything about it. it just, and most, as a matter of fact, uh, right now, uh, my heart, your heart and my heart, my liver, and all that is just working just overtime right now. Even when you sleep, it's working, doing what it's supposed to do. It don't ask any questions, just doing what it's supposed to do, just going on about its business. And that's the way the church ought to be operating, efficiently and effectively. But then again, I'm, I'm here today to talk to you about the vital sign. We're checking up on ourselves and see what we need here. Now, the first thing I want you to understand is, is that you got to understand that we have to be a living entity in this context. You got to be alive. Because if you're dead, you ain't got no pulse. You know any dead folk that heart still beating? Huh? I wish I had somebody. So we're talking about the first thing you got to do is the first thing that this text teaches us today is that Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and he preached Jesus Christ, Lord of life. Am I right or wrong? And listen to me. He preached that Jesus, the Son of God, is life. And look, and look, look what the scripture says. This is what I want you to get. This is what we got to do. He said, he preached Jesus. He said, you crucified him. Huh? And then he said, 
but he, God declared him to be both Lord and Christ. But you crucified him. You killed him. And this is what the Bible says. The Bible says those who were sitting in the audience were cut to their heart. They were pricked. They came under conviction. Their conscience was pricked. I wish I had somebody. And we will, uh, I don't care, you can be a member of a church for 900 years. But if you never have fallen under conviction about your sinful condition and your relationship to Christ, you ain't quite there yet. Because you can't repent until you discover that you've done something wrong. People that have never done anything wrong is don't have anything to repent of. Now, you've done something wrong. You just might not want to acknowledge it. Because the scripture said we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Without exception, I don't care what your mama's name, I don't care what your daddy's name, I don't care what your ethnicity is, I don't care whether you're young or old, I don't care. The book says all and all mean everybody. And you know, y'all, all you got to do is go back and check your track record. Because it's flush this way out in your life. Am I right or wrong? <laughs> so we got to be alive, first of all. That's the first thing. You got to be. And the way you get alive, you got to put your, the, the, a church, a living church, a church is a living church, is a church that has heard the gospel and put their faith in Jesus Christ. Heaven repented of their sin of unbelief. I ain't talking about, I ain't talking about your, your, your sin out of your behavior yet. See, a lot of y'all think that because you smoke cigarettes, that's what's going to, you think that's your sin. That, that's not the sin that condemned. You think because you have committed an act of adultery that that's the sin that condemned you. You might have done that because you are condemned, but that's not what condemned you. I wish I had somebody. That lie, you know, some of y'all just, you just lie. That's not what condemned you. Here's what condemned you. I want you to understand that. Don't you ever forget this. Here is the sin that condemned and sent men to the pits of hell. The sin of unbelief. He that believeth is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's what condemns us. And sometimes we waste an inordinate amount of time. We get people to believe, and then after a while, they'll get rid of the rest of that stuff. There ain't no way in the world you can be filled with the Holy Spirit and continue to live an unholy life. That's all. And, and the Holy Spirit's not going to come and set up residence in your life until you trust in Jesus. Didn't he say after you repent, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost? It's right there in the text. We got all these religious folk going to church. They sing well. They dance well and all that kind of stuff. But they don't live well. You don't live well because you ain't got that in you which makes you live well. I never worry about people that's filled with the Holy Spirit, controlled by the Spirit, doing certain things. Yeah. Let me name a few of them. Adultery, uh -huh. fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, barrier, emulation, wrath, strife, heresy, envy, murder, drunkenness, and the like. Never you don't have to worry about that. Because, see, when your life is under the control of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit produces holy living. And listen to me. 
walk in the spirit and you will not who may under any condition, in other words, he said it's absolutely impossible to do those things when you walk in the spirit. Because the spirit will produce in you such things as love, and joy, and peace, and long suffering, and gentleness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and meekness, and temperance, and you'll find yourself singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to one in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God our Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. That's good living now. Oh, that's good living. That's stress-free living now. Hmm. That's living the heavenly life and only the spirit. He said that's, that's what you get. That's the gift you get. When you, when you trust in him. And then it's your choice. Well, you're going to submit to him and yield to him and let him do his thing in your life. Or you can choose to continue to go on the way you're going. Walk in the flesh, do all that crazy stuff. But that's not what I came to talk to you about. But you have to get on board. You got to get on board, though, and understand what it is that the Spirit is trying to do in our lives, right? So now what, what, how are you going to maintain that? Now God's going to give it to you. So have you, you wondered, y'all remember when you first believed how joyous you were and how excited you were about this new life you found? You, feel, you had a sense of freedom in you. You had a sense of relief. You had a sense of wholeness and completion. You was a young, new novice. You was just a new convert. But you just felt good about yourself, felt good about life for a few minutes, didn't you? How do you maintain that? How, how do you maintain that standard of living, that God life, that God is putting? God, you, you got it, you didn't deserve it. You know where you were, you know what you've done, you know what you think, you know that you, how, what, what you believe, you know all of it was inconsistent with God and God's nature. But all of a sudden, God touched your heart, and all of a sudden, boy, you had a new, fresh breath of life. And you liked it. You enjoyed it. It felt good, didn't it? Yep. Now, you wonder, now, why can't I keep that? Why can't I maintain that? It's in the text. It's in the text. Vital sign number one. It is. They were committed. To the discipline of the church. Now let me flesh it out. One, the Bible says that they were committed to Bible study. They continued, they were devoted, they were steadfast, they persevered, they stuck with it, the apostles' doctrine. Teaching. No such thing as a healthy Christian or a healthy church without teaching. You got to learn something for you to know something. I wish I had somebody. You can't know God. You can't know God's ways until you get this word in you. Let me tell you something else. Ain't no blessing for you. People sit in the church right now, lives are miserable. And I can tell you one thing that they don't have. They don't have the truth in them. Yo, listen to me. You know what we lay it on? We lay it on people. We lay it on circumstances. We lay it on conditions. We lay it on the economy. We say it's the politicians. 
And we say it's the policies that they establish. But no, Christian folk need to continue in the truth. And you'll experience the peace of God that passes all understanding in spite of your circumstance, in spite of folk, in spite of the economy, in spite of politics. That's something God wants to intend for you to know. See? That's like right now. Some of y'all got some, your back is up against the wall right now. Financially. Huh? The economy is bad at your house. And you worry. But if you've been going where I go, you would know that God will meet your need. According to his riches and glory. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. See, I, I didn't find that. See, you see, Ross Perot didn't tell me that. The word said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I wish I had somebody up in here today. Hmm? Mine's all messed up. You're disturbed, you're worried. But I found somebody said, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving let your request be made known to the one that owns everything. I, I, I see, you see, you see, uh, uh, the man down in Silicon Valley didn't tell me that. He got more money than anybody in the world, but he ain't letting go of none of it. Huh? But I tell you what he did give. He gave something like $100 million to the uh, research on how to, how to bring the population down. You know what that means in, in, in layman language? How to kill off a bunch of us. <laughs> See, we sitting up here, we sleepwalking. <laughs> and the people that, 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 got, that, that got resources, they're they trying to figure out a way to get rid of some of y'all so they have more space. Y'all don't hear me? And we just sleepwalking. Don't know what's going on. But I know somebody. That's why we stay worried. What they going to do to me? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No, no, no. He said, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. I ain't trying to fix this thing. Matter of fact, before it's all, when it's all said, no, I'm going to tear it all up. Y'all do read that. Y'all believe that, don't you? But he did say he's going to destroy this thing and mess it all up. Then he's going to start a new thing. Am I right about it? Are you committed to that which is going to help you to grow, build your faith? Are you committed to personal Bible study? Are you committed to group Bible study? Are you committed to building your life on the Word of God? Do you meditate on the Word of God day and night in order to do all that is written in it? Then by doing so, you make your way prosperous, and then you guarantee your that you will have good success. That's what the book says. Hmm? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed to the word of the living God. That's when a lot of us can't overcome our bad habits because we, we haven't internalized enough truth. You got to get it in you, people. Let me tell y'all something that I, that I found out. <clears throat> now, Every person that I know is physically alive. They love to eat. One of the, one of the things you don't have to, you don't have to train them for, they're going to eat you. They're going to they gonna get some groceries. And sometimes a whole lot of it. But if you can get your hands on, that's one way you know you're alive, Moses. You have an appetite. You want to eat. 
Let me tell you one of the ways, according to Peter, the one way you know that you're born again. Do you have an appetite for the truth? Let me tell y'all something. Let me let me tell y'all mothers and fathers something. Y'all y'all want good for y'all children, but your children will never get born again apart from the word. Hmm? Let me tell you what you do. Y'all so crazy that y'all children know what's better for them than you do. I just, I marvel sometimes at how crazy we are. Yeah, you're crazy when a child knows more than you. Now, yes. You might well say amen. Yes. Some little child just starts, I don't want to go to no Sunday school. I don't like to go to no Sunday school. I don't want well, you know, they said they didn't want to go to no Sunday school. God left me behind. Yes. Then you expect the child to grow into some kind of you know, responsible, orderly citizen, and the child don't have no truth. If you, if you, if you hope to get saved, Peter said we are born again by the word. That's, that's what it is, people. Now listen to me. I'm, I'm taking my time right here because I'm a, I'm a serious, I'm serious about this Bible study business. I am. My church is not, but I am. My church don't believe that the Word of God would help their children. And you don't, and you, and you tell me that I'm, you, you say I don't know what I'm talking about. I will slap you. You want to get me to fight? I'll, I'll come out, I'll, I'll go home and get my 38. <laughs> Just tell me that I'm lying. Come, let me tell you why I know. I know what I'm talking about. Just look around you. Where are our children? Mary, where are our children on Sunday morning? Well, there she is right there. Where are they? Where are they, Della? Where are they, Tina? They're not here. Where are our young people, Sister Tanya and Sister and Brother Robert? Where are they? Tell me anything. I believe. Where are they? We don't believe it. We just simply don't believe in this thing that, that God has the power to, to raise our children up in spite of this condition that we have right here in South Dallas. We have allowed our environment, our community, and everything to just overwhelm us, and we are running from pillar to post looking for help. And all the help we have, the Bible says it's, salvation is, is in our mouth, in our, it, right in our mouth. It's not us. All you got to do is confess it. Even in our mouth. You won't know that unless you start to study the book. You won't know it so we can create a healthy environment here for everybody to thrive in unless we continue. He didn't say just periodically. He said they were devoted. He said they continued, in the King James verse, they continued steadfastly where nothing could shake them off of their center. I remember one time, I'm going to tell you how, how, how messed up we are. Now, I, me and Jean laugh about this all the time. Matter of fact, we laugh about it the other day. I've seen this with my own eyes. I'll tell you how shallow we are sometimes. And how lightly we take this thing about the power of God's word. I remember one time, I was on my way to, Jean and I was on our way to Sunday school. And we uh, saw one of our members on the way to Sunday school. I never will forget, I can see her right now. She had a blue dress on, a navy blue dress, high heel shoes, way up there. <laughs> I still can see it in my mind. This, 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 this did something to me emotionally. And uh, 
So we goes on test. Do you want to ride? No, 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 no. I'm just enjoying this. Um, I walk on. Walk on. I said, okay, wasn't far. Matter of fact, around the corner. So Jean and I went on route. I came on the Sunday school head. But notice the person never showed up. I said, hmm. Next time I said, I said, what happened? I thought you was on your way to Sunday school. Oh, one of my girlfriends came by and said, let's go to the grocery store. And I went to the grocery store with her. I said, well, I'll be there. But y'all, y- y- you don't get the seriousness of that. That's serious business. And then we wonder sometimes why we can't stay, why we can't stick. The enemy is going to be trying to shake you off your center every minute, every hour, every day. If you're not grounded and rooted and established in the truth, you're subject to go down. So they continue steadfastly. I mean, they, they, they made their mind up that this is it. I found a new way. I found a better way. If I would check your pulse today, when it comes to your continuation in Bible study, what would the reading be? Would I find any life there? If I check your reading, if I, if, I, if I check your pulse, if I put the EKG on you this morning and, and, and it represents your, your, how you are involved in your study of God's word, what would the reading be? Would I have to have a film around here? That's what you got to check, people. This is serious business. Notice that now. The Bible says they... They, Peter preached to them. They were convicted. They repented. They were added. And they continued steadfastly. Number two. Bible sign. They were committed Fellowship. Now, fellowship, it means more than showing up and drinking coffee and eating cookies and drinking soda water and all the other stuff that we eat. That's just one piece of it because certainly that can be a part of it. But fellowship is the word that comes from the word kanania and it means cooperation and participation. I'm going to tell you, I told you one way that you know you're a Christian, didn't you? And what I told you about the word, didn't you? You got a hunger for the word, didn't you? Let me tell you about number two, where you know that you're saved. You like to hang out with God's folk. There's no such thing as being a Christian and not having a, a, a get pleasure out of association and cooperation and participation with the people of God. Hmm. You got to walk with it. Turn your Bible with me right quick, y'all. I want, I want you to turn with your Bible with me to 1 John. That's, that's all we back there in the back. I want you to turn to 1 John. Y'all got it? Uh, chapter 1. You got it? Let me read verse number 5 in your hearing. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, Yet, walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with who? That's what the book says. 
know I ain't much to look at. I know that. I'm not the most impressive looking thing around here. But I'm one of God's children. You see what I'm saying? And, and all the rest of us got some flaws. I'm looking at you. Every one of us in there got a flaw or two somewhere. But we belong to God. We are children of the light. And when we walk in the light, we have fellowship with those who are in the light. And I like this part right here. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from our sins. In other words, I got some flaws. Brian, you still got some flaws. You love the Lord, but you got some flaws. But he said, you're walking in the light, and God is continually forgiving and cleansing you. So you can continue in fellowship with him and with one another. Ain't that good news? God got a way. He got a perfect plan for us to get along and to keep moving on with our lives. And so that, that, that we go right there. So we are committed to, one, to the apostles' doctrine and to fellowship at Kananiah. Participation, cooperation, investment in one another's lives. That's what real children of God do. You hear me? That's a vital sign. Let me ask you a question. If I took your reading today on this fellowship issue, what kind of pulse would I get? Look, people, this, God, this, 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 let me tell you, part of, the, part of God's strategy for growing the body is that we are to invest in one another's lives. It, it ain't just about Pastor Charles. It's about all of us doing our part to help one another to become all that God intends for us to be. It ain't just about it. Everybody sit up here looking at me. Saying, well, what, I wonder what the pastor's going to do. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you. What you going to do? You got a responsibility here. The pulse is beating. What's the reading? I'm going to have to put, um, I'm gonna have to put that, uh, what that you got in your heart, BJ? I'm going to have to put a pacemaker on you. See, BJ got a pacemaker in his heart right now to keep his heart going like it's supposed to. Only thing about it, in this business, you don't get no pacemaker. <laughs> you either have a real thing or you don't have it. Ain't nothing artificial going to help you to, to live this life. You're going to have to live this life based on God's design or don't live it. Am I right or wrong? All right. Unless I keep you too long. I've already been here too long already. Because I got the number two. I'm, talking, I'm still talking about commitment now. They were committed to what? Bible study, the apostles' doctrine to teach them. Two, they committed to fellowship. Three, they committed to prayer. They committed to conversation and communion with God through the discipline of prayer. Talking to God about their situation about life, about their circumstances, about their ministry, about whatever that's important to them, whatever is a concern to them, they let God in on it through their prayer life. Let me tell you something about, now it's good for me, and I also have an intercessory prayer for everybody in this, in this auditorium, and I do. But it sure is nice if you can pray for yourself. And number two, it's nice if you can pray for yourself and able to pray for somebody else. Do you hear what I just said? It's a wonderful thing. God has given us that privilege. Don't you know it's a privilege to be able to call up on the living God, the God that made everything, the God that knows everything, the God that has all power, the God has made it possible that you can come through his tone of grace and find help in your time of need and you ain't got to beg nobody. 
And God will hear and answer your prayer. It doesn't matter about your gender, your ethnicity, your wealth, or your social background. It does not matter. The psalmist says that his eyes are always open and looking and gazing toward this place. His ears are open, listen for our prayer. I wish I had somebody. No. He invites you to come. Come on to me. God understands. God understands the struggle that you're having. He understands the challenge you have in life. And he's made it possible for you to come. And he's not going to fuss at you. For coming and bringing your issues to him. See, I, I, you know, this, this, this principle can be spread across any area of life. But God said, if any man lack wisdom, let him come, let him ask. He said, God will give it to you abundantly, bountifully, and upbraid it not. You know what that simply means? That God's not going to chastise you for coming and bringing, letting him know that you're ignorant. God is so long, God, God want to give us wisdom. God's not going to chastise you because you acknowledge in his prayer that I'm weak. God want to strengthen you so bad. I wish I had somebody. Huh? But this is what I found out. Now, I know some of you guys got offended because you, when I said you acknowledge that you're ignorant. But let me, let me tell you something that I found out about me. The more I learn, that I understand how dumb I am. I wish I had somebody. I said, the more I learn, I found out how, just how ignorant I am. I don't know nothing. And a little dab, I just a little surface stuff. Just a little, just, yeah, I mean, can matter of fact, it's so, it's so, it's so in, in, in the, in the, in the, Respective to all that there is, it's, it's not even enough that you can see the difference. And I would advise all of us, just humble yourself and just acknowledge that I'm just a human being and I just don't know. Huh? Now within myself, I don't. Now, but it changes things when I depend upon God. God will give me wisdom. Any situation I get into, all I got to do, suppose you're having a problem with your children at home. You hadn't been to Dr. Spock's child raising class. Huh? B.F. Skinner hadn't taught you about behavior analysis and all that kind of You hadn't learned uh, Maslow hierarchy of needs. You hadn't learned none of that. So you hung out there, right? I don't know any of that kind of stuff. But you said, Lord. <laughs> Lord, I don't know. <laughs> I wish I had somebody in here. He knows. As a matter of fact, that stuff that Dr. Spock's putting out, they're still trying to straighten us out now because he messed us up. That's when half our children messed up and my generation of children messed up. Me and Sister Grant's children and and uh, who else? Mary Jackson's children and MC's children. Because we were listening to Dr. Spock rather than listening to God. <laughs> I wish I had somebody. And look, what, and look what we got here. We got some stuff that we got to straighten out. Suppose we had just listen to God. God knows all about that. But, but that's, th that's three things right there. Let me rush on because the earth has already stood up there. And they, they're so obedient. And then breaking of bread. And now, you know what that breaking of bread means? Now, in this particular context, you got to take it just the way that it, in, in the context that it's set in, he says, the apostles' doctrine, uh, fellowship, prayer, and then he said breaking of bread. So in order to keep it in its proper context, it has to be re referenced something spiritual. And so breaking of bread means 
that we are, in taking the, the, the elements here today, are to remember and reflect and keep our attention on Jesus. He's the one that died for us. He's the one that was buried and raised from the dead. Remember what he did for you. Remember he shed his precious blood for us. That's it. Committed. I told you to keep your mind stayed on him. He'll keep you in perfect peace. If anybody, uh, any, any, any group of people in our community is troubled, it's people like us of African descent. But he said he gave you a way out. He said breaking of bread. Keep your mind stayed on Jesus. I don't care how your back is up against the wall. I don't care how difficult it gets. Your circumstances do not get any more difficult than Jesus. Jesus literally died. How much more difficult can things get for you? But on Sunday morning, he was raised with all power in his hand. Keep your mind stayed on him, and when life gets real difficult, some way, somehow, you might remember that he got up, and because he got up, I'll get up out of my mess too. Ain't nothing too hard for God. If God can raise the dead, he can feed the hungry. Ain't nothing too hard for God. If he can raise the dead, he can heal your body. He can teach you how to raise your children. He can help you to make a living for you and your family. Ain't nothing too hard for God. Just keep your mind stayed on him. And the people that have done and made the greatest contribution in this society have to face the more difficult. They face great challenges in life. Huh? And we want this microwave kind of living. Quick. In my house, I can't even wait till my popcorn popped anymore. I had to go get and stick it in the microwave. Up. Bam! I want it now. Y'all don't hear me. And that's the way we live our lives. We live with this quick fix kind of stuff. Ain't willing to go through nothing. Hmm? That's why most of y'all ain't healthy now because you eat no more uh, microwave dinners instead of cooking a dinner. Hmm? All that salt. All them noodles y'all eating. Yes. Stick them in the microwave, warm them up, ain't got no nutrition in it. <laughs> I said, I told you, I, I, Jane, don't you bring no noodles to this house? <laughs> Not them canned noodles anyway. You're going to fix some. You better fix it from scratch. I get some nutrition out of this stuff. But let me, let me finish up here right quick. I got two more things here. I, I, boy, I tell you what, I just enjoy the word. Uh, and I get carried away sometimes, Todd. If I get carried away, Todd, uh, just ask God for strength so you can stand on that door till I quit. <laughs> He'll give it to you. Ain't nothing too hard for him. He'll give you strength to stand. One of, one of, yeah, Brenda said, yeah, he'll give it to you. Now, let me finish up right quick. They're committed, and verse number 44 teaches us another lesson there. All the believers were together. All the ones believing. That means that a healthy church is a connected church. You connect it to one another. I'm always troubled with people that tell me that they get more pleasure out of being with them than being with us. 
all the one believing. That's the present active participle. I mean that they had started believing and they kept on believing. And they just keep right on believing. And because they keep on believing, they stick together. Yeah. Not only were they, not, 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 not only were they, they, they connect, the Bible says, now all the believers were together and they had all things common. Now, without any further explanation on that, you got that? They connected, right? Not only were they connected, but they were compassionate. You know what they did? They saw the need, hurts of the rest of the people in the congregation who didn't have what they had, so they sold what they had and shared it with those who had a need. Compassion. We got some people in church and sing, but they ain't got no compassion. I ain't giving up nothing. Because what I got to do, see, I got to use all of my money so I can have on my best outfit. I can look best, have on my good jewelry on Sunday morning so everybody can see me and see how good I look. And I don't care how hungry they are. I don't care how naked they are. I don't care what they don't have. I'm looking good. But there are a few Holy Ghost folks in here. And they live a simple life so they will have more to share with those who are in need. Hmm. Give up something what you have. So they were compassionate. If I took you pulse this morning, how compassionate are you? If I took your pulse this morning based on our Tuesday evening program, who been fussing about bringing a little grocery so other folk can have something to eat? Huh? Talk to me. Don't, don't, don't you hold your hand up. Because I know some of you. I've been here. I, I hear you off in the background. I hear you murmuring. I, I, I hear you. And you don't know what's going on with folk. As a matter of fact, you don't know because you don't care. I'm saying all that this morning because we got to get, what about the vital sign? Do we, do we feel the pulse this morning? Does anybody have any compassion for the people of God that don't have what you have? Yeah. They don't. You got a nice house. Can they get a good night's nice sleep at your house if they had to? You got a cupboard full of food. Can they get a meal at your house? Huh? When last time you had a party at your house and invited somebody? Other than your kinfolk. Huh? You need to do that. That's what Christian people do. That's what the church do. The church is about having compassion. People are, people are, people, there are people in, in every church that is not as wealthy as you are, without exception. They're not there to be looked at and frowned upon. It don't mean that they're in bad, they're, they're in bad standing with God because they don't have what you have. And you got to get rid of that old, that old success kind of theology that y'all preaching around here. And not want people to be cursed because they lost their job. No, no, no. We just got some cursed folk running some of these jobs. It ain't all the time your fault. If the truth be told, somebody want to make it my fault because they made grandma a slave. So you don't even hear me this morning. But grandma didn't have nothing to do with that. Grandpa didn't have nothing to do with that. That had to do with somebody perverted belief and thought. Hmm. Did anybody hear me this morning? Now, all the pain, a lot of the stuff that's going on in our community right now, you can't, you, don't, don't, don't be pointing your finger at people. God going to bring people in here that's hurting. 
And, and y'all let me stay around here a couple more years. I'm going to give away all of y'all money. <laughs> They're hurting folks. It's on the way. And I'm, I'm going I'm to expect you to bring your tithes and your offering to this church so that we collectively can touch and meet the needs of hurting people that God placed in our midst. And I don't apologize for it. I'm not going to apologize. And I feel sorry for you if you complain. As a matter of fact, you can complain out loud. We'll have you up in front of the church, and we'll say you sinned against this body. And we expect you to repent. If you don't repent, you got to go. <laughs> now that's what the deacon's going to do. <laughs> but see, you see, you see, people, see, it, one of the greatest sins that we, we commit against people that, that we don't deal with in our church, I'm just, I'm just dropping this in because I said what I said, and I want you to understand some things. See, most of the time we, we think about gross sin. If anybody comes in here that's on drugs, what we just, ooh. Somebody that's unfaithful of infidelity, ooh. Some girl come up pregnant, ooh. But nobody want to forgive them. We sit up in here, got something against Sally, got something against Joe, but never get around to forgiving one another. And it's just as much an offense, maybe even more, than a person that's on drugs. And if we're going to excommunicate the drug abuser, we got to excommunicate the unforgiven. I wish I had somebody. A lot of times we don't understand. We take this thing too lightly. God's about us living a righteous and a holy life. I don't care, in all areas of life. Hmm? That's when he give us a way out. Rather than, us have to, rather than the church have to call us accountable, we can hold ourselves accountable. That's when he tell you to examine your own heart and see if you're in the faith. So you can deal with your issues personally before it gets to be a public issue. Am I right or wrong? And all of us have issues we need to deal with. And so let me get off of that so I can finish up here. Here we go. Finally, finally, I said to you that I said it's committed, right? I'm checking pulses here this morning. Rose Terrace, are you committed to Bible study? Rose Terrace Bible Fellowship, are you connected? Are you a connected body? Well, you are connected to one another. Rose Terrace, are you compassionate? And then lastly, Rose Terrace, are you consistent? Look what they said. This is not a hit and miss kind of thing once in a while. Verse number, verse number 46 says, every day they continue every day to meet together. They were consistent. And in there, not only did they meet together in the temple, but they were consistent in breaking bread from house to house. In other words, they were consistent in seeing about one another. And while they were seeing about one another, they broke bread together. Not only did they do that, but they were singing and making a joyful noise to the Lord on an ongoing basis. I wish I had somebody. And there it is, right? They were praising and they were enjoying the favor of the community because the community looked out at them and said, Those are the people of God. Yes. Not once in a while, but they were consistent every day. I ain't through yet. Carnegie, this is what the book said. When a church is healthy, God continues to add to it. 
And we sit up here and talk all we want to. You think we, we, we ain't got it together yet? It's something sickly wrong with us when ain't nobody keep coming this way. Won't nobody follow us to the house of prayer and the house of worship where there's help and healing. The book says that God added to the healthy church daily such as should be saved. You know what that meant? That meant that God's people were bearing witnesses out in the marketplace. Because you don't get saved without somebody talking about that man from Galilee. Somebody got to tell the story of how Jesus came. He died for us, was buried and raised again on the third day with all power in his hand. Somebody got to tell the world. And we tell the world, and our demeanor is right. Our deportment is right. And we are righteous, upright people. And then the result is in God's hand. God adds to the church. And to be quite honest about it, unless, and that's just that's what I like, what do I like about Rose Terrace Bible Fellowship? We are, we got some real super saved people up in here. Now we got, I, I, I got to get them out of their fleshly ways. So they can become, that's what I, y'all wondering what I was talking to the men's about this morning. And uh, that's what I was talking to the men's about. I called the men, I said, men, we're going to have to be more impactful. God expects for us to impact this world. And they'll tell you. And I said, the thing that concerns me now, that here we are, a group of men, and we're not influencing and impacting the lives of people around us. And we need to ask ourselves, why? When God himself has declared that we are to bear fruit. We got to ask ourselves some serious questions. We got to check our pulse. And I thank God for the road trip for us this morning that we're willing to do that. We're willing to take a look at ourselves and examine ourselves and see what we are. Because I'm going to ask you in a few minutes, based on my, this presentation this morning, I'm going to ask you in a few minutes to take some definite action this year. And uh, my prayer is that you, you would be faithful in carrying out your commitment. You hear what I just said? I'm finished, but I'm going to say this to you. God wants and expect Rose Terrace Bible Fellowship to be a healthy church. And the signs of life must manifest itself in this congregation. It is not something that's complex. It's very simple. God is saying the basic rudimentary things that need to be taking place in this church this year so he can make it everything that he wants it to be. One, we got to be committed. We got to be committed to Bible study, committed to fellowship with one another, committed to prayer, and committed to breaking of bread, remembering, reflecting on Jesus Christ. He said, number two, that we're going to have to be connected. We got to be connected to one another. We got to spend quality time together. One of the things, let me tell y'all what, what I, let me tell you one of the things that's the shortcomings in this church. Y'all think we meet too much and too long, but we don't meet enough. We don't meet enough. That book said that those people met every day, but we fuss about meeting twice a week. And we got to ask ourselves why. And then, then we got a portion that you fuss and you'll come. Yeah. Then we got, a, got another portion that just going to make that once a week meeting. That's it. Ain't no fussing, ain't no fighting. I just ain't going to do it. Then you don't hear me. You can't grow. You can't be. God can't do everything he wants to do. God cannot use Tina or he can't use David, or can't use Sister Lucy, or Mary, or Tanya to do what he wants them to do in your life when you're not connected to them. Y'all hear what I just said? Then there has to be some compassion. Oh, we got to be a compassionate people. We got to feel the pains of our fellow man and be willing to make sacrifices so somebody else can have something. Because they're going to do the same thing. It's because they, that one day, everybody's going to get their time. 
Today is my day to give, but tomorrow I need to receive. Lastly, we got to be consistent. See, it's, somebody said this morning, we got to, you can't just let your religion show here at the church house. You got to let your religion manifest itself out there at your house. And out there in the, in the public square. And then you have to do the same. Listen to me. Let's start to, let, let's start to be conscious and intentional, observe ourselves, and let the world see that we have some joy in our life. You, you got reason to praise God anyway, don't you? Huh? And, and, and it's a nice thing when people will, don't, don't you go out and tell nobody that you're a Christian. Let them say you must be a child of God. He said they had favor with the people, and he's not talking about people in the church house. He's talking about people out in the community knew that these people were children of God because of the way they treated one another. Now, I want you to think for a minute. Now, this is what I'm going to do. Come on, praise team. We're going to sing first. I think it's the best way to do it. Come on. Come on, praise team. We're going to sing. We're going to sing and give you time to reflect on what I just said. That's what I just talked about. You need some reflecting time. Give us, the appro- give us a good song, a good appropriate song. Give us a, what, what's, what's appropriate, brother? brother? You the song, man. Okay, the blood will never lose its power. That's it. Come on, let's stand up together. We're going to join with this, this group, and we're going to sing in a reflective kind of mode today. Because he said, breaking bread. Let's keep our attention on him. We're going to sing, the blood will never lose its power. Okay, we're ready. <laughs>